Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Aditya Mohite. I'm from Los Alamos National Lab. And uh, today, as the title of my talk suggests, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about hybrid perovskite solar cells, opportunities and challenges. Uh, before I begin, I want to uh, thank uh, the funding organization at Los Alamos, LDRD, and the Office of Basic Energy Sciences, which has funded this research. Um, and in the background uh, picture, what you see is sort of an image of these large grain perovskites uh, uh, crystals that uh, is a technique that we've used uh, to grow these crystals and uh, you'll hear a lot more about them. Okay, so before I begin, uh, just acknowledgements. Uh, I did not do the work. Uh, there's a bunch of talented people who are involved in this research. Um, uh, Vani Ni, who is, uh, who's my postdoc, uh, he's a very talented postdoc. Jean Christophe, uh, who's done the spectroscopy work. And Sinhan Sai, who is a graduate student who's uh, working at Los Alamos. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there's uh, uh, other members at Los Alamos, uh, Sergey Tretiak, who's leading the theory effort, Gautam Gupta, Jared Crochet, Amanda Newkirch. Uh, also, this work's been done in collaboration with the uh, Canad Cities group at Northwestern. Jackie, even, and Claudine have helped with the theory. Uh, they're from University of Rennes in France, and uh, Professor Alam's group uh, at Purdue University. So, um, the topics for today, I'm going to uh, talk about three things. Solar cells, their current status and opportunities. And then I'm going to talk about hybrid perovskite solar cells, the growth of these large grain size bulk crystalline thin films, uh, and discuss uh, some of their optoelectronic properties. And then finally, I'm going uh, to touch upon some of uh, uh, some, issue, some uh, recent work that we've done on in testing the stability of these perovskite solar cells. And then I'm going to introduce these layered perovskites as a possible alternative to the 3D perovskite uh, solar cells. Okay, so uh, just to begin, um, you know, photovoltaics, uh, the working principle is quite simple. You basically have a PN junction with a light shining on it, or some kind of a junction with a light shining on it. And if you want to get maximum efficiency, what you need to do is maximize the light absorption to generate a high density of electrons and holes. Uh, if these electrons and holes can then diffuse to an internal junction, uh, uh, they can get separated. And uh, if they are collected, then they give you a current which uh, and a voltage that gives rise to uh, a pho the photovoltaic effect. And so if you do these three things, then you can truly maximize the efficiency of a photovoltaic device. And so the motivation really for us uh, was that if you look at this chart, this famous NREL uh, photovoltaic efficiency chart, probably a multi-billion dollar chart, there's two things I'd like to point out. One is that the state of art single crystalline solar, silicon solar cells were at, are at 24.5 percent today, but in contrast, if you look at generation three solar cells, which refers to typically solution processed um, technologies, uh, you know, made out of nanostructured materials, quantum dots, uh, polymers, uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon nanotubes, etc. These efficiencies have been capped at about 10 percent, in spite of about 20, 25 years of research. And so the circle here points at uh, where these efficiencies are today. And it's interesting sort of to see uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, if you look at the dye-sensitized solar cells, they're right here. And then there's the organic solar cells which sort of intersect them. And then right above it is these, this new technology of hybrid perovskite solar cells which is sort of taken off. And so by no means I mean to... Uh, uh, I mean to, uh, by no means I'm, uh, uh, I mean to sort of uh, say that these technologies were no good. It's just that we've learned a lot from, uh, from these uh, sort of technologies, device processing uh, and controlling microstructure, etc. And that has helped, I think, perovskites, uh, the perovskite technology to sort of gain these efficiencies as, uh, uh, as they have. Where now today, if the efficiency of perovskite solar cells are about 22%. All right, so we've thought a lot about this and have had the opportunity to work on a lot of these generation three technologies. And, and what we think is that in general, there is, there is a fundamental bottleneck that exists uh, in <coughs> for transport, charge transport in these nanostructured films. And so here I have two examples. One is the example of these uh, zero dimensional uh, classical, uh, classical uh, confined systems, quantum dots. Uh, and the second one is on one-dimensional systems, which are these carbon nanotubes. So if you take the case of quantum dots, what happens is that 
polydispersity strongly affects the transport in these materials. What does that mean? Which means that if you, if you make a film of these quantum dots and if one of the, uh, a few, few of these quantum dots have slightly different size, then what happens is this manifests as sort of trapped states within the band gap and so serves as a recombination center for the charge uh, and you get sort of losses in your current. Same is the case with carbon nanotubes. Again, if you make sort of a film of these carbon nanotubes, uh, different diameters of carbon nanotubes uh, act as uh, this polydispersity in these carbon nanotubes act as sort of trap states, which then sort of trap your, uh, uh, your, your, your photogenerated charge and then sort of kills your transport. And so if you, <coughs> if you were to generalize this problem, you would say that if there are n particles, then you have n interfaces. Right, the number of particles uh, in the uh, you have the same number of interfaces which you have to overcome in order to get nice transport, and so there is a very high probability of recombination. And so, in order to overcome these sort of cha this challenge, people have uh, come up with these different types of architecture, like these mesoporous architectures. And we feel that these are like a boon and a curse. Boon because it allows you an opportunity to sort of extract all the charge. But it also serves as a recombination center because of the large surface area that they have. And so one has to really get this microstructure uh, exactly right in order to extract all the sort of current out of your device. And so our strategy wa uh, was that can we actually uh, sort of uh, can we actually come up with, an, uh, with a scheme where we can decrease the number of interfaces, right? And the ideal case is where you have a single interface, which is what you see in conventional semiconductor devices, where charge and uh, energy can flow uh, very efficiently across them, right? And so this, uh, uh, the discovery of these hybrid perovskites gave us an opportunity to do that. And so let me sort of touch upon what, uh, uh, what these are. So generally, uh, perovskites have a general formula of ABX3, and they've, been, they've existed since a very long time, and some of these classic examples are these barium titanate, strontium titanate, uh, etc. And so this organic inorganic, or also known as hybrid, is a special class of perovskites. And so as the name suggests, if you take an inorganic component, in this case lead iodide or lead chloride, and mix it with uh, this methyl ammonium iodide or chloride, which is uh, a salt, then you mix this and if you heat this, then you get sort of this brown colored film, which is, which is indicative of the uh, perovskite phase, right? And so it, it turns out that if you measure the optoelectronic properties, uh, this has quite remarkable properties. And so this has led to very high uh, power conversion efficiencies, for, especially for photovoltaic devices, but now has also been demonstrated, uh, uh, has also, sh uh, it has also been shown that these kind of materials will would be very use uh, would be very would be candidates for other types of optoelectronic devices like detectors or light emitting diodes or, or diodes or X-ray detectors uh, and so on. And so here's a, a list of uh, you know just representative publications that have emerged over these years. And as you can see, there's these a lot of high impact papers that have just come out and are constantly coming out in this last three years. And so uh, if you if you look at some of these properties. Uh, here I highlight two of them in red because I think this is what sort of distinguishes them from a conventional nanostructured film that uh, one would make from the, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these generation three materials like polymers or quantum dots or nanotubes, etc. One has a strong light absorption across the solar spectrum, which, which uh, is uh, uh, a mandatory requirement if you're trying to make a photovoltaic device. You want to try to capture as much of uh, the, the solar spectrum as possible. Also, uh, the optical excitation, light absorption in this gives rise to free carriers. The, uh, what does that mean? It means when, you, when, when, uh, when light generates electrons and holes, they are free to move about in your sample uh, as opposed to being coulombically bound or, or form these so-called excitons. Right? And so this exciton binding energy uh, is very, very small. It's negligible at room temperature, which, uh, uh, which allows these electron hole pairs to sort of, uh, sort of diffuse around uh, over large lengths, having a very large diffusion length of a few microns, and thus can be collected by these contacts. And so I think these are the two uh, uh, properties that sort of distinguish it from these, some of these nanostructured uh, films. And so uh, when we sort of started working on this in about uh, uh, in March of 2014, we found that there were several challenges that, that were there in the field. 
the first was that there was a lot of uh, uh, the, uh, lot of non reproducible uh, results on photovoltaic efficiencies there was a huge variation uh, when you made cells right which is indicated by this plot here you can see that while the peak efficiency is, uh, is about 7 6 7 percent there is a huge sort of a variation of what um, you know, what one can get in a batch. And this has sort of improved over years. This was a paper uh, by Yang et al. in Nature Materials in 2015 where they did solvent engineering to show that they could decrease this sort of uh, uh, non uh, or this improve the reproducibility of these devices. Also, in addition to this, a uh, lot of these uh, perovskite solar cells suffer from hysteresis in their uh, current and voltage characteristics. What does that mean? Which means that when you sweep your current one way and then you sort of sweep it back, you see that they don't follow the same trace. You get a different number for efficiency. And so, so it has, it, hysteresis has been attributed to several things, device structure, grain size dependence. Also, because this is an ionic material, it's been thought that ions sort of migrate around in this material. And so, this was also one of these challenges that existed today, uh, existed, uh, and it, it sort of exists even today uh, in this uh, in the field of hybrid perovskites. Another uh, challenge that we found was that, uh, that there was uh, the properties of these solar cells or these material was sort of very processing dependent. So depending on where you would process and what technique you would do process it with, one would sort of get a different result for uh, optical and electronic properties. And here are some examples which sort of show you there. This is just showing different lifetimes. Here showing a different sort of uh, defect density uh, just by uh, uh, on films that were processed in different ways. And so these were sort of fundamental challenges sort of that existed uh, 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 and, and in fact exist even today uh, in the field of hybrid perovskites. And so our, uh, so, so before I uh, tell you about this technique for growing these large crystals which sort of, uh, which we found sort of eliminates a lot of these things, uh, I want to uh, show you this chart of, uh, this is basically a chart of efficiency versus the number of years for single crystalline silicon. And it shows that um, in about, uh, uh, about 1952 or 53, that's when uh, people learned how to grow single crystalline, highly pure single crystalline silicon solar cells. And if you track the efficiency, you see that they, they saw the biggest jump. It, the efficiency of, of photovoltaic efficiency jumped to about 15%. And so I really want to, uh, this was really motivating for us and suggest that, you know, if you can really control the crystallinity of a material, then you may be able to uh, tremendously improve the performance uh, or the properties of uh, these solar cells. And so, uh, uh, having using this uh, idea in mind, we we uh, we came across we we sort of thought about this and said, what if we could make these crystals really really large and discovered this technique which we've sort of termed it the hot casting approach, right? And so uh, the way this technique works is you basically have a precursor maintained at about 70 degrees C in this case lead iodide and MaCl, uh, and then you take a substrate which is hot, uh, uh, and then you immediately transfer it from the hot plate to your spin quarter, drop your precursor solution, and start spinning. This happens within in less than five seconds, right? And so you spin for about 30 seconds, and as you're spinning, what's happening is that you're cooling your substrate, right? You're quenching it. And so, uh, at the end of uh, at the end of it, uh, when your spin coating sort of stops, if you look, what you end up is a film, a very uniform film, which has a lot of which has a which has these large sort of grains on it, right? And so, if you look at this, the prof uh, this is these images here are optical images for different substrate temperatures. And as you can see, as you increase your substrate temperature, you see that your grain size goes larger and larger. And so, what we found is that uh, the key here was sort of controlling the evaporation rate of the solvent for getting larger and larger crystals, right? And so, if you had a solvent sort of which was present, uh, then this allowed for the diffusion uh, of these molecules and for larger grain growth, right? And so, these are sort of the results which were sort of published in uh, our first paper uh, by Vani, e, which was in Science in 2015. Now, uh, in order to, uh, we, to we, we tested this hypothesis that the evaporation rate was critical by using different solvents. So here we used solvents which were of higher boiling point, NMP, which was at about 202 degrees centigrade, or DMF, which was about 150 uh, degrees centigrade. And what we truly found is if we used NMP, uh, then 
we found that the crystal size, the grain size was even larger and we could go all the way up to about a millimeter or even several millimeters if we needed to. I also want to refer you to this uh, additional uh, paper by, uh, from my group which is, uh, which is just, uh, just in press in Applied Materials today which shows that this technique can be uh, commercialized and, and you can use sort of conventional techniques like doctor blading which are you know used for large area solar cells uh, and you can get the sort of the same result with this. <coughs> now sort of uh, use, so the next, the first thing that we did was we looked at uh, what these films look like, right? And so when we looked at the polarized microscopy images, what we found uh, for the large grain is that as you change the, the polarizer angle, as you rotate the polarizer, one found that there's a uniform sort of color change within one grain, suggesting that this was bulk, uh, uh, bulk, uh, it was a bulk film and not made up of sort of nano crystallites. <laughs> Um, and if you do that with the small grains, you see that you have different sort of colors that emerge, suggesting that this was uh, fairly polycrystalline. We also looked at high resolution scanning electron microscopes. And if you look at the cross section of this, what you find is actually a bulk film. You don't see any pinholes or grain boundaries or even nanocrystalline sort of grains that are present here. So this suggested that what we had made was sort of a bulk like film. Uh, which, uh, which was much different than w what you would get with other conventional approaches like uh, post annealing and other approaches where you can act clearly see grain boundaries or, uh, or formation of sort of smaller grains. And so the first thing we did was tested, put this uh, uh, in, uh, in a simple photovoltaic uh, device architecture. And what we did was we sort of borrowed this from typically what's used in organic solar cells. Uh, put this as an FTO, P.PSS as the whole transport layer. We spin coated the perovskite, in this case was about 400 nanometers, and then put an electron transport layer which was PCBM, um, and then aluminum as a, as a top contact. Right. And if you look at the current, uh, this is the current density versus voltage. And as you see that as your grain size sort of increases, uh, you see this dramatic uh, improvement in your performance. Your current densities uh, increase and your voltage increases too. This is the external quantum efficiency, also represents sort of what the absorbance of this material is. And you can see uh, that it sort of turns on at about at the band edge and uh, has a very high quantum efficiency of about 85 to 90 percent. Um, uh, across sort of the visible part of the solar spectrum. If you integrate this, uh, what you end up is sort of uh, uh, the integrated short circuit current that you measure with the white light. And so there is very good agreement and so a nice way to check whether you've sort of done your measurement correctly. I want to mention that these measurements were performed in argon as these uh, materials are very uh, sensitive to humidity and I will talk about this uh, in, in a few minutes. Okay, so then if you look at the efficiency, the power conversion efficiency versus grain size, what you find is that as your uh, grain size increases, you see this strong correlation, uh, your power conversion efficiency increases, and then beyond a certain grain size, you see that it sort of saturates uh, and reaches uh, uh, its maximum value. And so the peak efficiency that we got from this, uh, uh, this exercise was about 18%, uh, which we were, we were pretty excited about. However, we wanted to check the reproducibility and the hysteresis in these devices. And so we did a lot of statistic, uh, statistical measurements where we looked at power conversion efficiency in this case for about 50 de devices. And what, you, what we found was the average efficiency, which is sort of uh, a relevant number when you're looking at you know, an ensemble of devices, we, was about 15.5% in these devices. And so if you'll see this 18% uh, device, which was just one point, was an outlier. If you looked at the, the, these JV curves, we, looked, we test for hysteresis by scanning the, the current and voltage going, uh, change, by going from forward bias to reverse bias and reverse to forward. And what we found was uh, there was no hysteresis. Right? We also did this as a function of sort of scan rate and found that again, the hysteresis was negligible in this case. Right? We, we were getting um, very reproducible curves which were sort of uh, uh, lying on top of each other and we were able to sort of extract uh, uh, a very accurate uh, value for efficiency. So, uh, so we t put this really to the test and so here's a device which we scan sort of 30 times back and forth. As you can see, there is very negligible hysteresis in these devices. Um, and, and so now from that point on, this was a very, uh, what I showed you was an unoptimized sort of a device. We've, we've moved on to use different types of, d done some band gap or interface engineering 
to change their uh, the band alignments and the right using the right contacts which would sort of improve our efficiency and so one of the candidates that we've used is nickel oxide as uh, uh, as a whole transport layer and what we've been able to get is efficiencies average efficiency of about 17.5 to 18 percent which is sort of represented here uh, in this uh, curve of efficiency versus number of devices and the figure here on the top really shows you again uh, the cross section of the perovskite that we informed again showing you a bulk like film not made up of nanograins or nanocrystallites um, also important to note here again that in in these these films uh, we don't see hysteresis independent of what sort of contact whole transport layer that we use suggesting that in indeed the, the these films are highly crystalline and um, uh, are, are not influenced by things like uh, ions moving around uh, through the grain boundaries um, or defects which are present uh, in these uh, at these grain boundaries now in order to understand why we were getting such nice performance we performed several sort of measurements one of the measurements we looked at was looked at the open circuit voltage as a function of grain size so if you look at the open circuit voltage what one found is that beyond a certain grain size you saw that the voltage jumped and then sort of it saturated this suggested that you have very little recombination in your films also we looked at the open circuit voltage as a function of light intensity and so we looked uh, looked at this for a sample which had small grains typically a few microns and uh, in, in the case of large grains now this measurement is sort of like the ideality factor of a diode and so if you get this value of k in this relationship of voc is equal to uh, n kt by q then they suggest that you have bimolecular recombination which means that you have electrons and holes recombining uh, to give you current there is no trap assisted uh, recombination that exists if there is trap assisted recombination then you would get a value which deviates from from one in in many cases higher and so that's what we saw for small grains you got a value of k greater than one but for these large grain you got this value uh, for k which was always one suggesting that uh, you had a very nice sort of a you had a bimolecular recombination which dominates during device operation we also looked at the optical properties of these using a, a simple confocal microscope um, so the first thing we did was measure the absorbance using this uh, uh, technique called transient reflectivity where you have a stage which is sort of uh, oscillated and is synced with your lock in amplifier and what you do is you very carefully measure the the transmission the reflection of the of the of the laser uh, light going across your sample and cali and really account for all the different losses of the substrate reflection from the substrate or transmission uh, and then get a very accurate number for an absorption coefficient which is sort of shown here in the black the red curve here shows you the photoluminescence uh, uh, in in these materials and so you'll see that there is very little stoke shift the photoluminescence sort of overlaps the absorption bandage uh, which is again indicative that you're you you've grown a very high quality crystalline semi, uh, 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 material and this is what you one expects uh, you know in classical semiconductors like for example if you measure gallium arsenide where you'll always see that your uh, photoluminescence and absorbance are uh, have very little stoke shift and are sort of overlapped so uh, using this photoluminescence microscopy we also looked at the dynamics the 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 decay of the photoluminescence which uh, which would uh, uh, allow us to test whether we were truly seeing a biomolecular uh, process and so what does that mean if you look at this picture on on the top left here uh, if you if you have a semiconductor a good quality semiconductor if you photo excite uh, this with a laser you have electron holes and uh, in an ideal case the only way <coughs> they should recombine is uh, by giving out uh, light right so the electrons and holes across the bandage will will uh, should recombine and give you light however uh, typically this is uh, something that you would not see for a lot of these sort of nanostructured materials you normally see a trap assisted or different type of mechanism how when we looked at are these these bulk crystalline like films this is exactly what we saw and so if you look at this time decay of this this has been fit with uh, using a sim simple second order rate equation which is given here which has only one fitting coefficient which is this bimolecular coefficient so this suggested that uh, that we did not need any additional terms which you normally have to use when you have some trap assisted sort of process uh, in your films and so this was uh, real clear proof that we were actually having 
um, uh, that we saw what, what was going on in these films was sort of pure biomolecular recombination. We also measured the open circuit voltage versus light excitation, uh, which is the number of suns. In this case, we went over about two or three orders of magnitude in intensity. And what we found that again, we got a value of k, which was one, suggesting that this, uh, everything that we were seeing in, in a device operation uh, was consistent in isolated films in optical measurements as well. All right, so um, with this, uh, what I'm going to do now is sort of uh, switch gears and, and move to another topic. I'm going to talk about uh, the stability of perovskite solar cells. Now, um, as you may have heard that, you know, EERE, the Sunshot Initiative, one of the major emphasis that they've been having is on trying to improve the stability and reliability of, of the photovoltaic devices, which has a direct implication on the cost of these materials. And so we feel that uh, while these perovskite efficiencies have gone very high and they'll continue to sort of reach, the, uh, you know, close to the theoretical limits, one of the things that will that it may probably make uh, may 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 be critical for this technology is stability. And so we've invested a lot of time in trying to understand um, what are, what are the what are the photophysical processes that are going on and and uh, what happens under uh, under conditions when you have a device which is soaking in you know uh, light over a long time. So just very quickly, I want to talk about what, what has been done before. And so people have looked at chemical stability, basically moisture sensitivity, and how these perovskites sort of degrade with moisture. People have also looked at photostability and seen that their performance or your current sort of drops when you, you photo excite or you light soak your device uh, under, uh, under constant illumination. Also, there's been this report where uh, you see that there is some phase separation from the McGehee group at Stanford, where you start seeing that there's phase separation and you see the uh, growth of this lower energy peak, right? And so, uh, what we thought was this was really critical to understand the photostability during device operation. We, uh, 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 in terms of the chemical stability, we think that there may be encapsulation schemes which will allow you to sort of prevent uh, uh, the influence of moisture on these devices, but photo, if, if your material is not photostable to light, then uh, it, may, it may not be possible to, it may not be a commercially viable sort of technology. And so we focused on the photostability and the way we performed our experiment was we took a standard solar cell, uh, which I described in the standard architecture as a planar solar cell, and put this in intermediate vacuum so we are not uh, influenced by humidity and other effects. And we can isolate the effects of light soaking uh, independent of these other effects. And so we measured the current density versus voltage. Again, it shows no hysteresis and measured um, the performance, uh, the figures of merit of a solar cell uh, by stressing the solar cell, which means we sat at point A, which is the open circuit voltage point, and at point B. And so, since you run your solar cell at the power at the power point, which is some combination of A and B, and so if you understand what happens at your open circuit voltage point and your short circuit point, uh, then what you some uh, then the power uh, the maximum power point is just some combination of the two. And so here's what the results show uh, uh, look like. Here's the open circuit voltage versus time. This is current density versus time. And as you see that as your, uh, with your time, you see a small increase in the open circuit voltage, but then it uh, becomes flat over time. And so when you turn your lights off and turn it back again, the open circuit voltage again uh, maintains its maximum level. Same, uh, now if you look at the short circuit current in contrast, what you see is that once it reaches a maximum value in the beginning, uh, you see these drops in the open circuit voltage and the magnitude of the drop is changes depending on where you are at this point. And so again, uh, you see these drops in the current, but there is really no drop that you see in voltages. If you turn your lights off and look at the performance, your, your, your current value reaches back to its maximum value that you started with. However, over time, again, it tends to drop. Right? And so if you look at then your power conversion efficiency, which is basically sort of the product of your voltage and current, uh, what you find is, it is the trend is uh, decided or is set by your, uh, your short circuit current. And so the power conversion efficiency as a function of time, uh, you see that over time it sort of drops because your, your short circuit current is dropping. And so that's sort of what you see. However, when you, re when you sort of rest your device in the dark, uh, you see that uh, your device sort of recovers to its original value. 
All right, so the first thing that we wanted to check was, was this truly a light dependent process? And so, uh, was it truly a light activated process? And so what we did was we performed this measurement where we measured the, uh, the short circuit current um, by maintaining the device at about one volt forward bias in the dark without any light. And so you were sort of injecting carriers. And we measured this, which is indicated by this red curve, and you found that, in fact, there was no degradation of the divide. This suggested that, indeed, that this was, uh, this was actually a light-activated process, which was sort of reducing your current in these devices. Then we went on to look at what happens. Are we actually seeing any structural degradation because of the light? And here's what, uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing you is an X-ray diffraction spectrum measured at steady state or before, uh, once you made the device fresh, and, and then after two hours of light soaking with AM 1.5 um, one sun uh, source. And what one found was there was really no change in the spectra, suggesting that your structure remained intact. <coughs> We also look at the photoluminescence uh, versus uh, emission energy here, uh, and uh, what one found was again that the spectra remained unchanged uh, after about one hour of illumination. And all these measurements sort of suggested that there was no sort of structural degradation in these films. Then we went on to look, uh, use uh, capacitance and voltage measurements to see what was really going on in the device. And so was there any buildup of charge in the, uh, in the depletion region? And so we measured the capacitance as a function of uh, DC bias. And so this blue curve was measured in the dark uh, just after the device was made. And then this red curve here was done after two hours of light soaking. And what we found was uh, indeed that there was some sort of uh, uh, evidence for trap charge which was, uh, uh, which was sort of built up in your device after about two hours of light soaking with an AM 1.5 uh, source. And so one can extract the charge density from this data as a function of the depletion width. Uh, and what one found was indeed that there was some build up of trap charges uh, in, the, in, in the device after about two hours of light soaking. We also looked at other measurements like photocurrent transient measurements, and this basically you use this again to detect the presence of trap charges. And the way this measurement works is that you you uh, you 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 set an open circuit voltage where there's no current flowing, and then you immediately switch to the short circuit, right, where you are sort of collecting charges. And so we did this uh, before illumination and after about two hours of illumination. And again, what we found that there was that the so this is sort of like the RC discharge time of your capacitor. And so we found that in, indeed there was presence of uh, trap charge which we could detect after two hours of uh, uh, illumination. Um, we also did uh, photoluminescence measurements, again showing that your photoluminescence sort of decreased after light excitation. Uh, and also the lifetime of this photoluminescence sort of decreased. And so now you no longer had this biomolecular process which you could use to sort of describe your, uh, your relaxation of your electrons and holes, but you had to sort of add some trap assisted term uh, in order to fit your decay curve. And so this suggested that there was something, uh, there was some presence of trap charge or some sort of states that we might be creating uh, within the band gap, uh, and that is what we were sort of detecting. Now, in order to sort of look at where these states were created, we performed, we looked at the absorbance measurements. So this is what I'm showing you is absorption as a function of uh, energy here uh, before and after light soaking. And what one found is that indeed that there was this increase in the absorbance in the near IR, uh, which is sort of uh, blown up in this, uh, in this inset here, uh, and suggested that, that we were forming some states in the middle of the band gap or within the band gap. Uh, this was sort of consistent with dielectric constant change measurements. And if you look at these, if you specifically look at the low frequency component, which tells you that there is a presence of sort of uh, uh, some states or some sort of trap charge which uh, exists in the middle of your band gap or uh, within the band gap. And so based on the, this, we came up with this model uh, where we, uh, uh, which works in the following way. If you look at your device, with light excitation, you create these light activated trap states in, within the band gap. We think that these are sort of mid gap type states. And over time, these accumulate uh, within the band gap and lead to sort of inhomogeneous fields or degradation of your photocurrent. Now, when you turn your lights off, uh, these states sort of dissipate away over time uh, and then you go back to your steady state. Right? And so the nice thing about this was that you can actually 
get back to your original steady state value in your efficiency. Now, uh, if we looked at the recovery of our solar cells, of how quickly does it go back to its original value more carefully. And so here's sort of the uh, short circuit current as a function of time. And this was done for three temperatures, uh, one uh, 25 degrees room temperature, 17 degrees, which, uh, which is very realistic to an operating temperature, and zero degrees C, just about a little bit lower than your uh, room temperature. And so if you look at these curves, <coughs> the black curve shows, so, so here's uh, so at this point we created a lot of these light activated uh, trap stage which led to this degradation and then uh, we sort of looked at how, turned the lights off and looked at the recovery. What we found was that the recovery was very, very fast. With, within less than a minute, the device recovered to about 96, 97 percent of its original value. And so in some sense this was sort of uh, good news that you could at least uh, uh, recover your device performance almost completely uh, in less than a minute. Now interestingly what we found is that this recovery time got even faster at about 70 degrees C. So if you, if you increase your temperature the recovery was much faster. However in contrast if you look at the 0 degree C curve you found that you could never really recover your device, right? suggesting that w whatever the process was uh, you had sort of uh, 0 degree C was below the threshold for the activation of these sort of trap states, uh, light activated trap states. right? And so using this uh, uh, measurement, uh, we, we, performed, we performed a long, uh, we, we measured the short circuit current and, and, the photo, and looked at the photo current uh, or the power conversion efficiency as a function of time. And what we found is that we could really use this temperature dependence to stabilize our solar cells. And so here's the short circuit current which was measured over you know, tw about 24 hours here and you can see that you can always recover this again suggesting that this was a photophysical process you were creating some light activated uh, trap states this was not degradation chemical or photochemical degradation and if you looked at this power conversion efficiency what one found was that at 0 degree C you can really stabilize your cell you see that there's no drop in the performance all the way up to about four suns where you actually we think that you start heating your cell up and you start seeing this decrease all right and so um, while these results were very instructive and uh, allowed us to sort of understand uh, you know what are sort of the what are the processes that are going on and what sort of controls photostability in these in these processes um, we were not quite happy because this uh, this was not an ideal result which very uh, and, and would have challenges if you were to sort of commercialize this sort of uh, uh, technology and so in order to sort of uh, overcome this or try to uh, sort of uh, get to a more stable system we started looking at these new systems that uh, that have been explored much earlier in 90s by David Mitzi's group these are these layered perovskites and so Here's the figure. Basically, they are, ino they are basically inorganic and organic compounds, uh, specifically inorganic components separated by these bulky organic molecules, right? And they are sort of these lamellar structures. And so, when you when you make a film of these, they tend to lie uh, in this sort of geometry, where your inorganic components are separated by the organic chains, right? And so, uh, Mitzi's group uh, had demonstrated the uh, was the first to demonstrate. Uh, that you could successfully inject charge into this and this was done in form of a, of a field effect transistor and so uh, recently because of uh, so much of work on the perovskites people have uh, measured some of these compounds and looked at the solar cell performance now the nice thing about these things are that you can uh, they, they, they have properties which are similar to the 3D uh, where you can tune your band gap and uh, you can get sort of the same sort of absorption uh, uh, of the solar photons in the same sort of wavelength region. And so when people measured these solar cell performances more recently, what they found was that the efficiency was sort of limited to about 4 to 5 percent. And so uh, we think that the reason for this is that when you make a film of this, there is this uh, organic barrier uh, or this organic layer in the middle which acts sort of like an insulating barrier for, for charge, trans, uh, charge transport out of plane and so the charge that is photo, uh, photo generated electrons and holes just sort of recombine over here and lead to sort of losses. In, uh, and so uh, in, in, if you were to really 
uh, if you wanted to really use this material, an ideal case would be to somehow grow these materials out of plane, such that your inorganic components sort of uh, uh, lie out of plane and, and are connected between the two uh, electrodes. Right? This uh, would allow you to have really good transport across your, your device without, uh, uh, and it would allow you to sort of isolate this insulating organic uh, chain that exists. And so, specifically, we use uh, some of these layered perovskites uh, from, from which were synthesized by the Mercury Canadities group at Northwestern. And if you look at this, these are sort of like also known as these ruddles and popper phases. Some of these common examples are the strontium-2, titanate-4, uh, calcium-2, ma uh, manganese, uh, uh, MnO4. And they have this general formula. And so we use this formula which has this butylamine, methylamine, lead-4 here, N is equal to 4, in this case I-13. Uh, and here's sort of what the structure looks like, and we applied our hot casting approach uh, to see uh, if, we, if uh, what sort of uh, if you could make an efficient device, and we were able to sort of control the crystallinity of these materials. And so here's sort of the results. Um, if you look at the X-ray diffraction, uh, just one D, what you wh what uh, uh, one found was something very interesting that your your out of plane peak, the 2 or 2 plane, was sort of seemed to have a much stronger signal as compared to your 1, uh, 1, 1, 1 plane. Also, if you look at the full width half maximum of your spectra, what one found is that for these hot casted films, uh, as you increase sort of the substrate temperature, your full width half maximum got sharper and sharp, uh, uh, smaller, suggesting that you had made a very crystalline film. If you, this is the absorbance of your uh, uh, the, uh, of your layered perovskite in this case, shown in the black curve, and the red one is the photoluminescence. Again, uh, the stoke shift was quite small, uh, suggesting that the the thin films were very very crystalline. Now, in order to really look at the orientation of these films, we looked at GVAX data uh, at Oregon National Lab, <coughs> and so what you find here is. Basically, uh, uh, the GVAX data for a post annealed film. Uh, this is for the layered perovskite that I mentioned. This is in comparison to a 3D film uh, or a 3D bulk perovskite. And in contrast, if you look at the hot cast film, what you what you find is beautiful sort of black spots, uh, which shows that we had near single in. Uh, near near uh, near single crystal out of plane orientation as in contrast to these sort of amorphous sort of rings that you you see for these post anneal films right and so this sort of suggested that you had this beautiful out of plane orientation which should really facilitate charge transport and so we put this to the test uh, we again use the simple architecture first we measured a post anneal uh, device which showed an efficiency of about 4.4% and then we use a, uh, our hot casting approach, one of these films, and you can see also there's a huge difference in the color of these films. And what we were able to get is efficiencies approaching 13%, right? Uh, and which was sort of about three times higher than what people had already measured. Now this really suggested that you know we had uh, sort of uh, we had this really efficient transport out of plane in these sort of films as opposed to the post annealed uh, process. If you looked at the statistics, the process was very reproducible. This is the external quantum efficiency. Again, matches very well with uh, the integrated EQ matches very well with the short circuit current density. And uh, this is just some mobility measurements, again, suggesting that these out of plane, when you, when, you, uh, when you flip the orientation of this, you can get a much higher mobility. We also tested for hysteresis. Again, there was no hysteresis negligible in these devices, which was nice. But more importantly, if you look at the stability, if you do the comparison of the stability of the 2D and the 3D perovskites, what one found was uh, that these 2D perovskites were very, very stable. So in this case, we took basically an as-made device, unencapsulated with P dot, and we looked at the stability for about 1400 hours. Right. And what one finds is that the 2D perovskites don't degrade. They hardly degrade and reach about 0.8 uh, or retain about 80% of their original sort of value. Whereas the 3D perovskites uh, see, uh, drop dramatically and sort of lose all the efficiency, almost become zero over this time. When you encapsulate these devices, again, you see that these 2D perovskites, right, they are really, really flat. They don't degrade at all in comparison to the 3D perovskites. 
We also tested this, uh, or I should mention that th these measurements were done with, uh, you know, on a constant light stress using an AM 1.51 sun source, and we didn't use any sort of UV filters or anything, and so this was sort of full spectrum uh, um, uh, illumination. This is what you would expect on a bright sort of sunny day uh, with a device uh, uh, which is mounted on your roof. <coughs> We also looked at the humidity as these materials tend to be very uh, prone to degradation with humidity. And so here's an uncap un un unencapsulated device. The 2D perovskite in this case shows uh, uh, degradation, uh, but the rate of degradation is again much slower than what you would expect uh, for a 3D case which sort of degrade completely degraded in about 10 hours time. And so if you in encapsulated this device, if you looked at the 2D perovskite case, you found that this uh, uh, this was very robust against moisture and we saw that there was no de almost no degradation uh, uh, all the way up to about 1200 to 1400 hours whereas the 3D perovskite degraded in about 500 hours. Right? And so uh, with this we think that this, uh, this might be while the efficiencies are about at about 13 percent but uh, we think that there is no reason why the efficiencies cannot reach uh, uh, efficiencies that, w that one would expect from these 3D um, uh, the, the 3D counterpart and we think that because of the stability this is a tremendous opportunity for researchers to work with these compounds and get to uh, get to uh, solar cells which are very efficient about 20 percent uh, or higher with uh, with very very good stability which is very important for um, for for this sort of for commercializing this technology and so with that i will i will thank you again for the attention and um, and and, uh, and i'll summarize my talk so i told you about a one step solution process approach to grow these highly crystalline bulk like perovskite films this is a highly reproducible history uh, process you get hysteresis free devices independent of the scan rate or direction or even contacts that you use. Uh, what you see is uh, behavior that is very reminiscent of these classical 3-5 semiconductors like gallium arsenide. You see a pure bimolecular combination. Also, what we found was that the photostability in these large grain perovskites is due to the formation of light activated trap states and this can be sort of controlled uh, by controlling the temperature. Um, and finally, I told you about layered perovskite as a potential alternative uh, for high efficiency photovoltaics with stability as, uh, uh, and, 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 and we think that this would be a very promising direction to pursue um, in this area of hybrid perovskites.